بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وقرر بزدنا علما الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We're on the 27th day of Ramadan It's a day that also has a lot of weight So it's a great blessing these last 10 days at the entire month but these last 10 days are special days especially the odd ones so we're on our session five of Jawahar al-Quran which are Jawahar in Arabic generally means jewel it can also mean pearl but he's using it specifically to mean jewel it also means essence in theology so like Jawahar al-Tawheed is actually most of the commentators call Imam al-Laqani's book the pearl of Tawheed uh, so anything precious. So the Jawhar is the essence of something. And, and essences are precious. Your own essence is precious. You can lose parts of your body, which are also precious undeniably, but they actually have monetary value in Sharia. Whereas the, the, the human being, does, does uh, the body has a monetary value, but not the soul. Soul's priceless. That's why it's called nafs, which is from a word, uh, one of the derivations is nafis, which is precious. So the, the, the essence is something precious. So he's looking at these precious meanings that uh, the Quran is filled with. So I just want to do a quick review from yesterday. He identifies these six aims of the Quran. These are the maqasid. And remember, Imam al-Ghazali is a maqasidi scholar. Like he, he is really somebody who's not... He, he, he was very wary of what he called the mutarasimun. And he actually um, denounces them. These are scholars that he felt did not look at the meanings. They were simply trapped in the, the form. Uh, for instance, in logic, you have formal logic and you have material logic. The formal logic, you can have absolutely sound syllogisms that are completely false. So if you don't know the material of the logic, the matter that makes up the syllogism and how that works, you'll make big mistakes in logic. The same is true in anything. The maqsad should always be uppermost. In fact, uh, if, if people remember, there was a book some time ago called The um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of them was begin with the end. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al umur bi maqasidiha, you know, that matters are based on their maqasid. And so the Quran has maqasid. So maqsad is your, your aim. Maqsid in Arabic with the kasra is your actually physical destination. But the maqsad is your, is your intentional destination. It's, it's your goal that is not a material or physical goal. It could involve materiality, but in your mind, it's where you're headed. Uh, it's not a physical movement. So he basically looks at what he calls the momentous things, these muhimma, and then what he calls the divisions that complete them. So the three uh, mutammima or mutimma. Uh, so atmim or atim in the dua. Ta'rif al mad'u'i ilayhi, the definition of the one whom men are called, or men meaning men and women. Ta'rif uh, al-sirat al-mustaqim, to know what the path is to the one you're called to. And then uh, that what you have to follow, what's uh, obligatory. Because he says the path to God is mulazama and mukhalafa. So those are the two. It's, it's adhering to certain things and avoiding other things. Uh, and this is what is called uh, targhib and tarheeb. Uh, it's also called awamar uh, and nawahi. These are all terms that are used. Uh, the Quran uses awamar and nawahi. Th those things were commanded to do and those things that were prohibit prohibited from doing. And then he has ta'rif al-hal and al wusuri ilayhi. And then really uh, defining the state, the hal of the one who arrives to knowledge of God. And al wusul uh, is it's used uh, problematically because a lot of people misunderstand it. Wusul to God is not a physical arrival, and it's, it's, it means ma'rifa. Because what Imam al-Ghazali says, and it's quite beautiful, he says that 
there's no physical travel to God because God is He's closer to us than the carotid artery, the thing that gives us consciousness itself. Because you cut the carotid artery off in a chokehold and a person goes unconscious. So consciousness itself is from the carotid artery, you know, the physical uh, awareness. And so what he says is because God is nearer to us than our jugular veins, not in any physical, because God is not in any physical space, but in reality, and, and he says, therefore, it's really the mitha, the likeness, is a mirror. So you, it's like you're standing in front of a mirror and God has put all of his attributes that he wants you to know him by. He's put them in you. By analogy. Allah has the highest analogies. So when we hear that Allah is hearing, oh, he gave us hearing. We hear that Allah is seeing, he gave us sight. We hear that Allah is speaking, he gave us a speech. We hear that Allah has is hay. He gave us life, that he, the, all these attributes are in us. So in order for you to come to know God, you have to polish the mirror because the reason you can't see him is because the mirror is clouded and the mirror is your heart. So that's what you have to polish because the heart will reflect those mirrors. So that's, that's Imam Al-Ghazali's project in a nutshell. I mean, I really brought it down to the most basic fundamental uh, principles. So the ta'rif ahwar al mujibin al da'wa, those who answer the call. So, you know, these are the mutimma, those things that enhance the first three. So, the, those things are the condition of those who answer the call in the dunya. So, you see like Ahlullah and you see uh, Ahl al Batil, Ahl al Shaytan, Awliya Allah, Awliya al Rahman, Awliya al Shaytan. And then the second is also letting you know about the people who reject and what happens to them and, and, and then the proofs against them. And finally, Imarat uh, Manazir al Tariq. So the manzil of the Tariq is the dunya. And then, uh, you know, then you have the, the manazil on your path to Allah. And so those are the way stations in the dunya. And then you need basic izad when akhir izad is taqwa. The best provision is taqwa and the uhba, the, the preparedness, the istidad, getting ready for the journey. Because we have the, the journey in the dunya, which is 70, 60, and 70 years on average, according to the Prophet ﷺ for his ummah. Some people can live as long as 120. My own teacher, Marab al Hajj, lived to at least, by confirmation, 109. So people do, some people do live long lives, but most of us will live between 60 and 70 years. That, that's what the Prophet said, A'maru ummati ma bayna sitin wa sab'in. And I thought about that hadith and I realized it's actually a mercy because that's the last decade where people generally have good energy and good health. When you get into your 70s and your 80s, some people can retain it, but a lot of people begin to break down. So there's a, there's a mercy in being taken in that seventh decade, I think, um, because he's all mercy, the Prophet Sallallahu And also his, his people were given longer uh, 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 reward. They get more reward for less work. We're, we're the workers in the, in the gospel who come at the 11th hour, and they're given the same wages as the one that worked all day, and the ones that worked all day, they get upset. Like, why are they getting that? That was Isa's, alayhi salam, Jesus' indication of the Prophet's Ummah because we're, we're the ones that come at the, at the 11th hour. And then he put his sababa and his wustat together. I was sent in the hour, I and the hour, my coming in the hour is like these two and he put them together. So, so those are the six uh, and then, yeah, so those are the six. And then from those, he says there's an inshi'ab, so the, the, the branching out, the shu'ab that come out of that. So the shu'ab, shu'ab that come out of that, like a tree. The first three he calls uh, al-kibrit al-ahmar, which is basically the red sulfur, which traditionally was uh, in, in sacred alchemy, it was called the philosopher's stone. It was, it was 
يسمع عنه ولا يرى you hear about it but you never see it so they say that the awliya uh, especially the, 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 the great uh, awliya of the ummah they're like the kibrit rahmar because their company is transformative so they can actually transform somebody who's going the wrong way and then uh, get them to move towards the right way just by their sahba so that those that's and then he divides them into three yawaqit al-thalath so he's got the 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 yaqut which is a precious stone the red ruby and then the akhab so he's got the ahmar the akhab which is probably wardi it's like a less than humra they say some say it's gray blue gray um, but it's uh, it's basically a um, uh, another precious stone it's less precious than the first one uh, and then finally he uses the asfar which is the topaz which is for the af'al so each one of them are precious uh, but they have uh, rotab ranks and then dhikr al-ma'ad which is about the afterlife eschatology and if you want a big word for that from uh, religious studies so they call that eschaton in greek is the last matters so what happens in the afterlife and then you have dhikr as-sirat al-mustaqim so what's the straight path well the path is the path of tazkiya which is sometimes called takhliya uh, which is the kenosis uh, emptying out so you empty out the negative qualities and then you have the tahliya so the sirat al-mustaqim is basically adorning yourself with positive qualities and removing the negative qualities and and this is basically character development but it's also spiritual development within the soul and and the result of that if you if you do that path is sometimes not necessarily but sometimes what's called tajliya and that's really what imam al-ghazali is indicating that tajliya is basically what allah reveals himself to you and in and and there's a uh uh an indication there, there's a, a hadith uh, related that uh, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yatajalla lin nasi amma wa yatajalla li abi bakrin khasa like Allah's tajliya to people is general but to Abu Bakr it was specific um, so mm, those those hadiths i think uh, sometimes they're they're attacked but the the, the point is, is that there is this tajliya for some people. They will really have very powerful experiences where they become very aware of the divine presence. And for some people, it becomes constant. It's, it's just the way they are in the world. And then the dhikr ahwal al-awliya. Some people don't like the term saints. The sun, in, it comes from a... Uh, a word really which means holy uh, which is related to our word quds and so the saint is the one that qaddas allah sirruhu he has sanctified his soul so it's a perfectly good word i think uh, uh, the jews don't really have a concept they have a concept of the zadik which is the righteous person siddiq in our tradition for probably from the same root um, and those are the highest of the awliya, the siddiqun after the prophets. Every prophet is a wali, right? But they're also a nibi. And then you have the awliya that are under the... the uh, so wilaya is muktasaba. Uh, prophecy is mohuba. You, can't, that you cannot have, you cannot become a prophet. No matter how hard you try, no matter how uh, much work you did. But you can become a wali. So it's muktasaba, it's earned. And that's why the wilaya is the Prophet's life. People think, oh, well, he was just given. No, he earned his wilaya. His, his wilaya is the work that he did himself. His nabuwa is from Allah. So don't think that he's just, oh, it, it was all just given to him. No, he worked. He did the night prayers. He did the charity. He did all those things. And that is his, that's, iktisab for him but his nabuwa is is his esma the fact that he's protected all those things are those are um, just given from allah but his wilaya he 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 works just just like uh, the other people have to work for more and that's why even though he was forgiven he still stayed up at night that's his iktisab 
He didn't have to do that. Or even coming back, I mean, just the fact that uh, that he, um, you know, he took on this extraordinary uh, mantle for for humanity, and he was his concern was ummati ummati. It was never nafsi nafsi. On the yom al qiyamah, they all say nafsi nafsi. Even the prophets, the prophet him says ummati ummati. He's the only one. So everybody else is is in that other state. So uh, looking at ahwal al awliya and then dhikr ahwal al a'da, the conditions of God's enemies. So this is what happens to people that uh, are, are in adawa with God, like Pharaoh. And then God's arguments, dhikr muhajat al kufar. So those arguments that God gives his, his uh, servants, his prophets, and then uh, the, uh, the salihin. So now we're going to look at. Uh, the um, the branching of these. So this is in Shi'ab al-Ulum al So this is the branching of the knowledges that come out of these uh, Aqsam al-Ashara. The first knowledge is he calls Ulum al-Sadaf. Now Sadaf is is the shell that uh, uh, that the pearl is in. So the pearl actually, Rumi has a beautiful. Uh, he makes this uh, argument about the heart being like the pearl. A pearl is from sand that gets inside the uh, the sadaf and it irritates the uh, the the mollusk. So it irritates the, the 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 sea creature, and so the sea creature excretes this thing to try to put off to to ward off this irritation. And so it's through that irritation that the pearl developed. So Allah is putting all these irritants in our lives. And if we respond appropriately, it will turn us into precious pearls. But if we, if we fight it, then we're from the Nakibin, the Jahideen. So, so he calls these the Sadaf sciences. So the first one, he calls it Ilm Kharij al Huruf. He really means here Tajweed, because Tajweed essentially is really about Hukuk al Huruf, right? Uh, the uh, Imam al Jazari, he says that. Uh, it's i'ta'u kulli harfan haqqahu min sifatan laha wa mustahaqahu. So the definition of tawheed is giving every letter its haqq and its mustahaq. So the haqq is what inheres in it naturally, like uh, the qutb jad or the qalqala letters. So you, the haqq is to, if you say, uh, you know, qul huwa allahu ahad, so there's a little bounce at the end of that. So that's the qalqala. That's the haq of the dal. If you don't, if you don't do it, then dhalam ta dal, that you've, you've oppressed the dal. So he's not going to be happy. So you, you learn those. Because at akhdu bit tajweedi hatmun lazimu, manam yujawid al qurana athimu. Imam al Jazari says that, that you have to uh, take tajweed, it's a hatmun lazimu, it's, it's an obligation. And then he says, if you do, whoever doesn't recite the Quran with tajweed, is Athim. Now, I think out of mercy for the community, the ulama generally, not all of them, but the vast majority do say that the lahan khafi is not uh, sinful, um, which means that uh, as long as you're pronouncing the letters properly, uh, even if you're not able to, if you really can't, then there's still tasahul in that matter. Some people can't pronounce the bad. It's a hard letter for a lot of people. So that's, you know, and then Makharij al Hauf are, uh, you know, the Makharij al Hur in the Makharij al Hauf is Saba Ashar, Saba Ashar. Ala Ladi Yakhtaruhu, Man Yakhtabar. So, so the, there's 17 points of articulation. There's five major uh, points, and then from those five, there's 17. And there, there was a Khilaf. Sibawi said there were 16. Al Farra said there were 14. But people uh, agreed with uh, Al-Khalil Ibn Ahmad al-Farahidi because he's the great master uh, that uh, he wrote the first dictionary. Muwafiq, so, so he's the one. And then the Ilm al-Lugha. Lugha al-Quran, there's, there's just under 2,000 root words in the Quran. So in, in Arabic, you have roots, you have dyadic roots, and then you have uh, uh, the... Uh, the triliteral roots. So there's there's three. So 
So you have like Baraba. And, uh, and from that, you get all these uh, permutations from that. So you have like Daribun, which is somebody who's doing the Darb. And then you have Madrub, which is the one who's being struck. And then you have the Darb, which is the actual Masdar or the striking of it. So Daraba, right? Daribun, Darban, Madruban. Like, so, so that is learning that uh, takes some time. That's called morphology. But the logha he's talking about is knowing the diction, the word choice of the Quran. So there's words in the Quran like lahu. Every Arab knows lahu. If I ask, you know, like somebody who's an Arab from Syria, what's lahu? They'll usually say, like in English, what would you say? Yeah, entertainment, right? Yeah, lahu. But in, in the Quran, it can mean child. It can mean wife. So you can read the Quran thinking that you know Arabic. Like if you're a modern Arab and you read the Quran, like ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر. A lot of the Mufassirun say the Bahar there are the cities that are near water. It's not actually on the ocean. Others say it's uh, Ibn Abbas said it's قلت الأسماك in the ocean from the sins of people that the the fish diminish. So learning the language of Quran, there's a lot of nuances in the Quran. Like for instance, Allah says, Let not a people mock another people. So it says qawm. But then it says, you know, it's, it, then it's, uh, so it, it separates qawm from nisa. So why would that be? Because qawm are only the paternal side of a group. So like the akhwal are not from the qawm. The, the, the maternal side aren't from the qawm. Look in the Quran. He's the only prophet that addresses them. He doesn't say ya qawmi because he didn't have a father from them. He only had a mother. So they're not his qawm. So that's an example of the logha that's, that takes a lot of time to learn. It's called fiqh al uh, and then also the just dictionary definitions of it. And then you have nahu, which is a combination really generally. Nahu is, is i'rab, but it's also sarf. So nahu is grammar, and it includes uh, both uh, syntax, which is um, the way sentences work, and inflections, declensions, um, conjugations, and then also it includes morphology. So he co considers all of these shell sciences because they're not at the essence. You're learning them to get to the essence. They're necessary. Just like the body is a shell, but the body is for the, the, the reason. So the shell is important. You can't ignore it, but it's a shell. You shouldn't be worshiping it or serving it as if it's the most important thing in your life, which a lot of people do. So grammar, and then grammar is basically, you know, there's, uh, you, you, you learn it. It's actually not that terribly hard to learn grammar. It takes some time, but it's, it's, it's a relatively straightforward thing. But the problem with Arabic is it is a vast language. And you will always come across things that, unless you're a true master, you just haven't seen them before. And you can study. I've been working with Arabic for 40 years now, and I'm still, I feel like I'm a beginner. And I'm not saying that out of any humility. I'm saying that just as a, as a, as a true statement. It's an ocean. And so, but you can learn these things. And uh, we have beautiful books. Uh, that, that our scholars have developed to teach Arabic um, in, in the tradition I studied in. You know, I, I studied the Ajurumiya, the Mulhat al-Arab, the Al-Fiya. Those, those are the traditional books uh, that you study. My own teacher wrote a commentary, a beautiful commentary on the Al-Fiya. Uh, but he was a great grammarian. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is a great grammarian. It's amazing. His knowledge of Arabic is actually quite stunning. I mean, I'll give you one example of his knowledge of Arabic. So the, he studied with a man named Muhammad Bulshain, 
who's a great scholar from uh, uh, Eastern Mauritania. He wrote several uh, poems, uh, didactic poems in Arabic, Arajis. And um, I, I, I found some uh, online, like they had, um, and I, was, I got really excited about it. And uh, one of them was in, it was a thousand lines, 1,000 lines of poetry on ishtiqaq. So it's all the derivations. And then the other one was on um, the, uh, it was on morphology. So it was a very sophisticated text. I think it was 700 lines. So I got really excited and I went and I said, oh, you won't believe what I found on the, on the, uh, and then I, you know, I showed it to him and he looked at it and then he hands it to me and he started reciting it from memory. And uh, he kept going for quite some time and then he stopped and he said, Alhamdulillah, I, I learned those from my teacher because my teacher wrote those. So I memorized those when I was very young. And, and that's just, that's in a branch, just a, a far'i. It's not, it's not that, that's on top of all the other things. That, those are things that experts study uh, over and above. So... But uh, grammar is very important, and I would really highly recommend people. Even English grammar is important. People don't realize that you, you can't have a culture without grammar. You cannot. If you look at the Supreme Court justices, one of the things that they have to know is grammar. In fact, Antonin Scalia was a serious grammarian. His son did a PhD in grammar. Um, his book, Reading Law, a lot of it is grammatical. We had a case in, um, not me, but our civilization. There was a case in Massachusetts of an Oxford comma, some call it the Harvard comma, which is after when you have three things like uh, he's intelligent comma, uh, personable comma, and uh, young. So some people will just not put a comma on that last one between the, the, the second and the third and just have the conjunction and. So there was a case, it was a multi-million dollar case, and they lost the case because there was an omission of an Oxford comma. And so they conflated the two. It was, it was a dispute over wages, um, over time. And so because they were put together, it could have been interpreted that, that they were the same thing as opposed to two separate things, which the Oxford comma would have given them. That was a serious case they lost. I mean, luckily they had a lawyer that knew grammar because uh, Brian Garner, who's a great, he's probably the greatest American grammarian. He goes around teaching lawyers grammar because they don't teach grammar anymore. And it's a tragedy. And, and uh, you know, minority communities that don't have standard English are handicapped because of that. And so these people that say, oh, these are, uh, you know, this is the language that they should be taught in and things like that. It's a crime against those people because it's, it will hold them back. And that's what it's designed to do. So grammar is, uh, it's a birthright, really. People should be able to uh, learn. And this idea that people can't learn grammar, so you're saying, what, they're too stupid? Like they can't learn it? I mean, that in itself is an insult to say, oh, they're incapable of learning, because it's not true. They're perfectly capable of learning. So ilm tafsir al-zahir, this is another one. So knowing the outward tafsir, this is from the shell sciences. Uh, and then he has ulum al jawhar wal lubab. So these are really at the essence. And then he's got two. He begins with the sufla, for I don't know why. He must have a reason for doing that, as opposed to the ulya. I suppose to move you up to it. So the tabqa sufla are the ulum al tawabi al mutimma for the sciences of those three divisions in the, in, the, in the six. Remember, there were three the mutimma. So those are the three in that. And, and then the second is tabaqat al-uliya, which are sawabiq wa usul min al-ulum al muhimma So those are the three. So remember these, so you have to keep in mind the six aims. So the, the uliya, the higher ones, deal with the, the top three aims, which is knowing God, knowing the path to God, and then knowing the state of the people that get to God. And then the, the sufla is those lower three aims. So in the sufla, Ma'rifat qasas al Quran, knowing the stories of the Quran. So there's a lot of stories in the Quran about the, those who deny, and then also God's arguments. So um, 
there's the Qusas and Mustaqim studies these syllogisms in the Quran and uh, Allah uses enthymemes which are diminished syllogisms it's called the Qiyas Naqis so he uses it in the Quran to show people you know that the, the reason is logic what you know there's an argument that pe people make that uh, arguments for the existence of God are you can't ever arrive at this um, demonstrative proof that God exists. The point of the arguments for the existence of God, which are actually quite compelling, and anybody that says otherwise has never really studied them in any deep way. Uh, they kind of, oh, these five arguments of Aquinas or the Kalam cosmological argument. They're serious arguments. And, but the point is not to convince you because the believer is not going to be, the, a disbeliever is not be, going to be convinced by those arguments. The point is to let believers know that your faith is rational. That's the point. The point of those arguments is not to convince you that God exists. You already believe he exists. The point is to show you that your belief is not simply blind faith. It's based on an intelligent reasoning. And so your faith is actually, it's, it's rational. Because the definition of faith to these materialists and these atheists is, oh, they believe in something that has no proof. It has a dialectical proof. It might not have an apodictic or what they call demonstrative proof. It has a dialectical proof, which if they teach logic, people would know what these terms are. They used to teach logic. My, uh, my, all my... Uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my grandmother. I inherited her logic book from high school. They used to teach these things to people, but they took them out. Why did they take them out? I, that's a question for people to really genuinely ask. Why did they get rid of logic? If you get rid of logic, there's a, there's a sign all over this town that says human beings are not illegal. And that's a reference to the idea of an illegal immigrant. That's a logical fallacy. It's a fallacy of equivocation. Nobody's saying human beings are illegal. The immigration is what's illegal, not the human being. So, but they put these things up and then you're just wondering, like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything, right? So logic is really important. That's why Imam al he wrote five books on logic and really considered it an extremely important science. So al-Iqtisad fil al so he wrote these two. The Risala al-Qudsiya is the Qawaid al-Aqaid, it's a lesser book. The Iqtisad fil al is his higher level. So he, he really, it's a very important book and uh, it becomes really foundational for books of Kalam that follow it because he introduced some new things into Kalam. Um, and then Ilm al-Hudud. And remember, Imam al-Ghazali was not a proponent of Kalam. And, and there are Salafi people that attack Kalam. Imam al-Ghazali would agree with them in principle that Kalam is not something that everybody should study. But he felt that it was necessary for a certain segment to study so that they could refute. If you don't study philosophy, how do you refute the philosophers? Rad al-Shubuhat is, blood is no argument. So you have to know in order to be able to refute. How do you, if you don't know the debate between nominalism and essentialism, you won't know why people are arguing that gender is fluid. Because that's, that's a statement. How do you deconstruct that statement? Well, if you're, if you're a nominalist and don't believe that there's some essential nature to human beings, then Gender could be fluid. If I don't feel like a man, then I don't have to be a man. I can feel like a woman or feel like a non-binary. But if you actually believe that, no, God has essentialized you and, and you're biologically determined and that's your essence, whether you like it or not, if, if you don't, then you've got a psychological which it used to be considered uh, an illness. But now, because of the current uh, environment, they say, no, this is normal. But a lot of people feel like, eh, this can't be normal. So for us as Muslims, we have to stick to our beliefs. 
We can't let the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, determine our beliefs. We cannot allow our beliefs to shift because of the shifting tides of, uh, of whatever the opinions of the people are. So that's very important. Um, and then he has the ilm al-hudud and mawdu'a al ikhtisas bi amwal wa nisa. So transactional law, things that relate to uh, marriage and things like that. And then he wrote for that, he wrote, what he's showing you here is he's given a complete uh, holistic program to deal with all these issues. I mean, it's quite, you know, the more you study this man, the more you have to marvel at what he has accomplished because it really is quite stunning. So he wrote the Basit, the Wasit, and the Wajiz. And these are all, you know, he, these are his books of fiqh, the, the, the detailed, the concise, and then the mediator between the two, which is the Wasit. So these are in his furu'ah. And then he has the Rub al Jinayat uh, in, in the uh, jurisprudence. It's a very small section on uh, what we would call here the criminal code. And then Rub al Nikah, these are the Ikhtisasat bin Nisa. So these relate specifically to marriage and the rights of women. The vast majority of rights in marriage are women's rights. You know, the men's rights in marriage, he does have some rights, but they're, they're very limited compared to the woman. Her rights. If you study Sharia properly, you will see that the vast majority of rights are to protect women and children. And then you have Rub' al-Mu'amalat, which is, uh, this is, uh, that shouldn't be quarter on crime. That's a mistake in the, in the thing. That should be on the transactions, like um, all the things that relate to wealth. I mean, obviously theft and things like that is part of that, but that's in the other Rub' al-Jinayat. So then the tabaqat al uliya So th that's the, the, he's looking at those, the sufla. Now the higher ones. And these are ashrafuha liyanhu ilm al maqsad. So they're, they're, th this is the highest because this is the knowledge of the purpose of why the prophets are sent. They're sent to teach us our Lord. That's the purpose of, of the prophets. They're sent to teach us our Lord. So that's knowledge of God in the last day. And then knowledge of the Sirat al Mustaqim, which has Ma'rifat Tiskit al Nafs and Qat al Aqabat al Sifat al Muhlikat. So these are the things that are destructive. So that's Tazkiya, or it's sometimes called Tahliya, and then Tahliya, uh, the purification of the heart and then removal of the destructive uh, qualities. What happened? So, so that that is uh, the uh, the removal of the destructive quality, and then you have tahliya, beautification of the soul. So, tazkiyatu nafs is is basically tahliya and tahliya, removal of destructive qualities, beautification of positive qualities, and then. The, you have the highest, which is ma'rifa of Allah, ilmu that, and those are in all of the ayahs. He identifies all these ayahs, by the way. So these, the, those top three that are in the olive color, those are the ilmu durar. He calls those the pearls. These are the jewels, and this is the the book is the pearls, the jewels and the pearls. So, and then ilmu al akhira. So, there you have it. And now you have Bahr al-Af'al. So first you had the ilm of that. Now you have ilm al-Af'al. And, oh, sorry, we're still... Okay, so the, these all come, these are the sciences that come out of his works. So you have medicine which is the science of health. And then you have astronomy, which is studying the cosmos and looking at the heavens. You know, the, uh, uh, he says, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Imam al-Laqani, 
انظر الى نفسك ثم انتقل الى العالم العلوي ثم السفلي تجد به صنعا بديع الخلقي بديع الحكمي ولكن عليه قام الدليل العدمي so he says that you know that you have the uh, I'm, I'm fasting so I'm starting to because <laughs> last night was uh, anyway um, I'm starting to lose my, my this is a weakness of human beings take food all I, all I really need is tea <laughs> like I can go without food but tea is a little tough so uh, where were we so these are the bahar of his af'al Ilm al-Tashri, anatomy, and then also all these obscure sciences, uh, nuclear physics and other things, and also you have the ulum uh, al So then, fi wajhat tasmiya bil al-qab alati luqiba bihi aqsam al-Quran. So everything in the world of possession, this is called alam al-mulk, right? Alam al-mulk wa shahada. Mulk is what you can see. Anything you can see is part of the mulk. Uh, and obviously what you can see on a microscope. Alam al-ghayb is what you cannot see. That's called uh, the malakut. So he's saying that the sabab al-ta'bir an ma'ani alam al-malakut fi al-Quran bi amthiratin min alam al-shahada. So why the entities of the invisible world are explained in Quran by means of similitudes from the visible world. So whenever Allah is trying to explain to us the unseen world, he uses the visible world to teach us analogies, qiyas, because this is the great genius of the human being is that we're able to work in analogies. This is how he's created us. So how to find the connection between the visible and the invisible worlds? So the, the, the know with certainty, he says, that the secrets of the visible world are veiled from the soul's which are defiled by love of the world. So hubba dunya will actually be a hijab. It will veil you from the, the knowledge of the malakut. It, it will veil you. The shells of the Quran are not opened at all to reveal its jewels to those who are unmindful. So the shell, there's people that can learn the shell knowledges, but to open the shell and get the jewels, that is work. That's the ghos. Right, so he uses these allegories of jewels and valuables in the Quran. So here he has for us the red brimstone at Kibrit al Ahmar, which again has the three, and then the Tiriyak al Akbar, which is the antidote. Those are all of the reasons why you should believe in the Quran, and and they cure the destructive poisons entering the the uh, your mind. So it protects you from all those negative uh, ideas that are out there. And then al-misk al-alfar, which is, these are shay yastashabuhu al-insan. The misk al-alfar is something that those of you who have traveled uh, to certain places, there are certain people that have this misk, which is not, you can't buy it in the marketplace. And there's also places where you can, you can, you can smell it. Uh, there are places in Medina where you can smell it. Um, there's, there's actually a place in the, uh, in the, uh, in Baqiya where it's very strong. And there's a place at um, Uhud, if, if you go to uh, Hamza, uh, Sayyidina Hamza's grave. And the first time that we were there, because we were told you have to go a certain time, which is when it comes, we literally, and somebody's here who was with me, we, we literally almost passed out. It was so strong. And it's something people have access to. It's not something like that you can't smell. And it's not from this world. Um, so, and, I, and it's saints, you know, the, the, the Christian saints that are the, these uh, pre-Islamic saints, the, their their places have them as well. The Christians know about this because they they have the same thing. So, this is something Allah gives certain people. Imam Nafi, when he spoke, people could smell it from his mouth. So it's just by Allah. And then the Ud. So these are what happens when you know these shayatin get what they deserve. 
which is a great blessing. So the red brimstone, that which turns the essence of the soul from the vices of a beast and the air of ignorance to the purity of the angels and their spirituality. Because we are between the angels. We have an angelic nature, which is our, our immaterial nature. And then we have our bestial nature, which is our material nature. Allah's made us a hybrid. So we have this hylomorphic uh, coming together. Uh, Allah calls it a khalq jadid, right? Like we created you another creation. So when the ruh was blown into the, the material body, it became another creation. So we are this, this, this coming together of the material and the immaterial into one. So we have the, the gravitational pull of, our, of our, our materiality. And then we have the spiritual pull of our immateriality. And so depending on which one you feed, like if you're feeding the, the bestial, it gets stronger and stronger. If you feed the other one, it gets stronger and stronger. So one pulls you up. You can't penetrate it unless you have sultan. So it takes power. And then the other one will pull you down and destroy you. Uh, so that's the red room. And then the, the cures for the poison of heresy, passions, and errors entering the soul. That's what the Tiriyaq al Akbar does. And then the, the fame of a person of knowledge spreads everywhere, like musk, even if that person prefers obscurity. So Ibn Atayla says that the, you know, he said, Man ken yuhib al khumul fuwa abd al khumul. Khumul to modern Arabs means laziness. But, but traditional, in traditional Arabic, it means, like if you say in Saudi Arabia, khamal, they, they think it means lazy. Is that, is that Syria too? Yeah. So, so you know, khamal. But khumul is actually somebody nobody knows about. So, you know, tuba liman akhmar Allahu dhikrahu. It's a blessing to be obscure. It's a tribulation to be well known. But he says, in kunta, uh, yani the, 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 the abd of Allah, it's the same whether he becomes well known or whether he's kept in obscurity. It shouldn't be something you seek. If you seek it, you're sick. So that, that is the, the, and one of the ways that it spread is through Al Sinat al Husad. So the people that envy the person, they'll actually, um, they say that's the fire that lights the oud, that burns the, the, the fragrance. And so the, the, alo, the aloe wood is the smoke that rises from the ashes of God's punishment of the hypocrites and his enemies. And it, bring, it brings great benefit to the believers. So the, how much time do I have left? Ten minutes. So the benefit of employing allegories in the Quran, these are, rumuz are symbols. You know, the Arabs have a name, Ramzi. You know, uh, in Egypt, they use that name. Uh, rumuz are symbols. And so, mm, what's the reason, right? Bayan sabab juhud al-mulhideen bir usur al diniya So, uh, what is that reason? So he says, these allegories open the doors of the unveiling of the seas of meanings of the Quran to you and show how to dive into these seas. Uh, one of the things that uh, the great Moroccan uh, sheikh of the 20th century, Ibn al-Habib said, إِنَّمَا الْكَوْنُ مَعَانٍ قَائِمَةٌ بِالصُّوَرِ كُلُّ مَنْ يُدْرِكُ هَذَا كَانَ مِنْ أَهْلَ الْعِبَرِ That creation is only images, meaning set up in images. So these are suwar. This is all forms. But there's meanings behind those forms. The ma'na inheres in the form. Just like you have formal logic, material logic. The material logic is the ma'na that inheres in the formal. So this is everywhere. Uh, and so, and uh, you could look at it in the, in the, uh, in, in the four causes that, that uh, our scholars uh, took from the Greeks but used in, their, in, in our tradition the material, the efficient, formal, and final. So the formal, that's the formal cause of tells you what it is, but the final is what's the meaning of it? What's it for? The material is what's it made of, the efficient is who produced it, but that final 
is that's the end, that's the maqsad, that's the ma'na, that's the purpose. And so um, how can some verses be preferred to others if they are all Allah's words? That's a good question. So how, like how can you have some, if it's all Qur'an and it's all kalam Allah and it's all uh, al-sifa of Allah that's qa'im bi, qa'ima bi nafsi, how, 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 do you have, how do you have some better than others? Well, the prophetic traditions have pointed to the nobility of some verses and the manifold multiplication of reward for recitation. So there's, there's verses that are held over other verses. Like prophets are all the same in their prophecy, but some are better than others in their tafdil. But they're all the same. The prophet said, لَا تُفَضِّلُونِي عَلَى Yunus ibn Matta. Don't prefer me over Yunus ibn Matta. And there's uh, riwayahs about Moses. Don't say I'm better than Moses. In his nubuwa. So they're the same in their nubuwa, but then there's darajat within that. So we're all equal in our humanity, but we're not equal in our accomplishments. We're not equal in our virtue and our vice. Some people are vicious, some people are virtuous, and some people are struggling between the two impulses. This is the, you, you cannot equate. Are they the same, those who know and those who don't know? Can you equate them? You can't. They're, so this whole idea, the modern world wants to level everything. They won't say, oh, everybody's equal. They're equal in their humanity. But the Prophet said, I was commanded to, to treat people according to their station. This is the hierarchy. And, and this whole attack on hierarchy is to destroy civilization. So everybody's equal in their slavery. That's communism. Communism is everybody's equal. They want to level everything. And then all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others, right? That's animal farm. That's the whole point of that book, was to explain to you what they were really up to, right? Once the great revolution's over, the pigs show up. You get rid of the king, and then you get, you, get, you know, they got rid of uh, Malik Idris. They said, uh, Ibris wala Idris. That was a slogan, in the Libyan revolution. So they gave, Allah gave them Iblis. And they had him for 42 years. So he got rid of the king. And then what do you want to do? Make his son the next ruler. It's all lies. And that's why people, people really need to read history and to understand that these are all tricks of Iblis. So just like we're not equal in our accomplishments, the Qur'an is equal in that it's all revelation, it's all from God. But it's not equal in the, in the, uh, the manazib. There are some verses that are over other verses. You can't equate Ayatul Kursi with the verse about debt. You know the Dain verse, the longest verse in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah. You can't equate the two. One is about God and the other is about human transactions. But they're both revelation. So we honor both of them, but we recognize the superiority because of the Prophet had he not told us. So we have Fatiha al Kitab. The Prophet said it's Afdar al Quran. There's a hadith, a man who's coming out of this uh, mission. The Prophet said, Can I teach you the, the Afdar al Quran? And he taught him Fatiha. And then you have Ayat al Kursi, which is Sayyidah Ayat al Quran. It's the uh, Ayat al-Quran. It's it's literally the, you know, it's it's the Sayyida. It's the, the the princess of the verses of the Quran. So uh, the you know the master, the mistress, and then Yasin. There there's uh, an indication that it's Qalb al-Quran uh, in in the Hadith. And then you have Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Ta'adilu thulat al-Quran. It equals one third of the Quran. Uh, Ikhlas is a miracle of theology. So when we look at, um, we've got five minutes left. So I think I'll, I'll save this for tomorrow because this is, this is worth taking time. With, Do we have questions? Mm -hmm.
Hmm. You briefly spoke about Imam al Ghazali's teachers in Sharia sciences. Who were his teachers in Tasawwuf? Are there still spiritual silsilas with al Ghazali in their chain? The um, his his own brother was a great master, and they were they were very close. So his brother was a master. The teachers that he studied with were masters. So his outward teachers were also inward masters. I mean, these were these were some of the greatest Muslims in our history that he studied with. So Radhani, uh, who he studied with, would have probably been, been he he learned uh, Tasawwuf early on. Um, so it's not like he suddenly had this realization. No, he he, but he he did have um, a crisis of epistemology of like how we know and came to the conclusion that intuitive knowledge was the highest if it was sound but intuitive knowledge is very dangerous because a lot of people can be deluded and and he was very aware of that and and he was also a great critic of sufis i mean he even though he recognized tasawwuf is an important science he, he also saw the inherent dangers in it and warned about several things the great scholars of our tradition were uh, were generally practitioners of tasawwuf. To say they weren't is just, it means you know nothing about Islamic history. You just haven't read tabaqat literature, you haven't really studied. Um, but the Sufis also had some pretty significant, significant deviance. And it's because of the nature of Sufism, it's very easy to lose your way. And so you had antinomial Sufis that abandoned Sharia, people that said, you know, I've reached knowledge of God, I no longer have to pray, things like this. So you all have that. These, these traditionally were called mutasawifa. They, the Sufiya were kind of people that were seen as over, you know. So, but you have, uh, you have tasawwuf is, is a very uh, important science. I'm actually, we're just finishing uh, a critical edition of I think one of the best books I've ever read, uh, which is by Ahmed Zarruq, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, who was called Muhtasib al-Ulama wal-Awliya, like the alms budsman of the, the awliya and the ulama. Because he was a great alim, but he was also uh, a serious practitioner of, of, of spiritual tradition. But he wrote a book, which is a commentary on Ibn Banna al-Saraqusti's uh, book called Al Mabahat Al Asliya, the, the basic research or the foundational studies. And that's a book on all the rules of Tasawwuf. The last section, which is called The Sufis of This Age, which was written in the eighth, as ninth century, I mean, he just says, Like he says that this used to be the best path. Now, now it's just a, a means of livelihood for people. And then he says, you call the one who goes on this path a salik, but the peop, which means the wayfarer. But the, the saliku halyom, the people on it today are halik. They're, they're, they're perishing. So he, he, and you know, he argues that they lost their rigor, that they don't, by the 19th century, you see a complete lack of rigor in our, in our books. They're amazing, and I, I swear to God, and I'm not saying this in any, I would not be worthy of being a student of Imam al-Bajuri. You know, I mean, I really, um, unless maybe just out of being a convert, he kind of had some pity on me, like uh, he'd see it as mu'allafat qulubuhum, you know, atasaddaq alayhi, because he's from the, you give him zakat for because he's a convert. But, um, you know, he's, he's a great scholar. These were amazing scholars. But the hadith rigor uh, really diminishes greatly in the latter period. They quote hadith that, um, and I'm not like I quote some of the hadith that I've quoted, but I point out that they're, they're weak. It's important to point that out. But very often they, they, they just say, qala rasulullah, and they don't really let you know that this isn't. The, so they're, they're, um, the, the Sufis are, uh, I think they're very important and uh, historically, and they're asking, do the Silsas still exist? Alhamdulillah, the chain uh, that uh, 
I, um, the Senate that I have from Sheikh uh, Bayyab bin Sadiq has Imam al Ghazali in it. So, Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm in a chain. I'm unworthy of it, and I admit that uh, with, with, without any false humility. But um, this is the time we're living in, so it's the latter days. Uh, the only consolation is th for teachers that lousy teachers is generally the students are pretty lousy too. So we're all just lousy together. <laughs> Uh, can you recommend translations of Quran based on someone's level of Islamic understanding, starting from a convert or beginner or advanced? Th there's good translations. Abdul Halim is good. I mean, all of them have limitations. It's just, there's no way you can translate the Quran. I truly believe the Quran is untranslatable. I, I just, I believe that. It's, it's too, Arabic is too vast. I mean, I was, uh, when we get into uh, the Fatiha, you know, when we were putting it together, the slides with uh, Sidi Ismail, may Allah reward him, he's been staying up all night, you know, to do this, to make this. So please pray for him, you know, may Allah bless him. And he just did a fantastic job. But we were looking at, uh, you know, the translation. He used one of the, I won't say who, but he used one of the translations for Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. It said, we worship you. To you we worship. And I said, no, no, no you have to put alone. Because iyaka, the fact that it's muqaddam ala na'budu, means alone. Only it's, it's for hasar. And, and that's unique to Arabic uh, as far as English goes. Like we, we can't say it in English without adding another word. But in Arabic, if I say, if, if Fatiha has said uh, na'buduka wa nasta'inuka, that could mean I worship you, but I also worship lat and uzza and manat. You know, in Arabic, you, you could say that. Whereas if you say, you alone, because it's muqaddam. So it's, it, the mansub is muqaddam. And then, look at using the damir there with iyaka, because just the fact that it's, it's, it's not muttasal with it, it's indicating a transcendence in the actual calligraphy. Because if I said na'buduka, the calf is connected to me, to my verb, na'buduka. That calf is muttasal. But when you say iyaka, the calf is separate. It's munfasal. And that's just uh, Arabic. It's an amazing language. Alhamdulillah. So the, the, the silsa are there. I mean, I, you know, I think you have to be careful with a lot of, I, personally, uh, I think people have to be very careful. I've always warned people about getting in, involved. You have to, because there are a lot of fraudulent people out there. Just, it's just the way it is. And so you just have to be very careful. But there are genuine people that can help you on your path to Allah. And, uh, and their sahba can be very valuable. Uh, so, uh, can you recommend, so the translation of, for a convert, I mean, like I said, I personally prefer uh, Arbery. He, he, I, I don't know if he was a crypto Muslim. I kind of have a suspicion. I don't know. He never declared his Islam, so I can't really say that with any certainty, but he certainly indicates the solace that he got from the Quran in his introduction. It's a beautiful translation. I think he knew Arabic very well. Uh, Pickthals is good. He also... Uh, knew Arabic quite well, but he was he was also a well known um, novelist, Pickthall, an English novelist. Uh, Abdul Hadim, I think, is good. Uh, uh, I think Thomas Cleary's is very interesting. Um, there, I, I have found a few things that uh, I thought were problematic, but overall, it's a very interesting tafsir. He he's got a beautiful. I love his style of writing. He's a minimalist. He's got a very beautiful way of uh, wording things. Um, he also did a gender neutral uh, translation, which can be cumbersome in, in things like Ayatul Kursi, where you have a lot of uh, pronouns, but he wanted to do it to remove any he, so that you know people, modern people reading that, that could be a barrier from them reading the Quran. So I think it was a very interesting uh, uh, idea behind it. Um, so, and then the study of Quran, there's people that attack it. It's an extraordinary 
uh, work of scholarship. And to deny that, I think, is is ahom. You know, don't deny uh, people their their due. It's an extraordinary and and several of the people that worked on it were not perennialists. There is some perennialism in it, which is obviously problematic. I think most people will recognize it pretty clearly. Um, all you have to do is Google perennialism and read about it, and then you'll know what verses. Um, but there's not that much in it. Um, so it has a lot of really good tafsir from classical tafsirs. Um, so I think it is a very useful book. But And I heard some people, I think what needs to be done is some qualified people need to go through it and then point out uh, some of the problems with it. I think that would be the best thing to do so that people could read it with, with that. You know, just it would only be a short essay on, on uh, some of the problems that are in, in the, uh, the, uh, the effort. But it's an incredible, stunning piece of scholarship. And I don't know, to deny that's just, to me, it's not really fair. Uh, what should be the project be for Muslim scholars in our age? Does the revival of Ghazali's project suffice? I mean, that's a really good question. I think we have to pray that Allah brings the Everybody has to know their place. Like, to get another Ghazali, is, is, that's going to be from God. If God sends him, marhaban bihi. He'll probably be denounced by most of the scholars of, of today, you know, if they tried to do the project. But, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to stick with Imam al-Ghazali. You know, I don't, I, don't I'm, I know my limits. You know, so everybody has to come to terms with their own mediocrity at a certain point in their life. Um, exceptional people are just, you know, they're very rare. They do come along. And if you can identify them in your age and then serve them, that's what I've tried to do. I think one of the most, I, I really believe that uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya is, is a mujaddid. I mean, I, and people can, say what they want. I think they don't know who he is. And, and he's also a mujtahid. So they have to be careful because he's working with a, a cr set of criteria that you don't understand. I mean, I recently watched something of some people criticizing his work. And it was clear to me that they didn't know usul al-fiqh just from listening to the, to the criticism. But they didn't understand the maqasid tradition. And they, so there's a lot of, it's good to know who you are. Uh, delusion is real. We're all deluded to some degree. Uh, for people that know homeopathy, there's a really interesting Sankaran. He's an uh, Indian homeopath who wrote a whole book about really the foundational problem with human beings is delusion. And so, you know, he has a whole system of homeopathy of getting to the delusion of that patient in front of you. What's his fundamental delusion? And then relating it to the, uh, to the actual remedies. It's very interesting. So people, and then we don't know very much. I mean, we, we can think we know a lot, but we don't. We're, our knowledge is very limited. Even the, the most learned people. What people, an immuno, immunologist, what they know about the, the, uh, the immune system, really? The immune system? I mean, you think you can learn it just from studying anatomy and physiology and because they're looking at it and they're just assuming things. They don't really know. I mean, there's so many things we don't know. And, and scientists are very arrogant often because they think they know and they don't. They, they, all they can do is do their best, but there should always be humility. And the great ones are humble. I mean, if you look at somebody like uh, Richard Feynman, who was uh, he won the Nobel Prize for quantum electrodynamics. I actually did his course on uh, uh, on physics. It's it's recorded, so it was a course that he used to teach at um, Cal Poly. Brilliant man. I mean, he's like he's at the highest levels of physics, and he his definition of physics was our expanding horizon, the expanding horizon of our own ignorance. In other words, the more we know, the more we find out, the more we find out, the less we know. That's what he was saying. So for instance, biologists like Darwin thought that when you go into the cell, it's gonna get simpler and simpler. 
he thought proto because they didn't have microscopes that we have today. So he thought it would get simple because he thought his whole theory is based on simple to complex. But what they found is the opposite. The deeper you go, the more complex it gets. One cell has more genetic information than, than the 25 million volumes in the Library of Congress. The complexity is beyond belief. So, the, so the humans should, we should just admit we're ignorant. You've only been given a little bit of knowledge. And then we get arrogant with knowledge. We, knowledge should, you know, if you, if you ever watch, because I, I lived in a date orchard when I was in um, the Emirates. I, I was an imam in a masjid there. And uh, all my, the people that prayed were all Afghan people. And, uh, you know, I was Maliki, so I prayed with my hands at my side. And then I read Warsh. So they were convinced I was just a total ignoramus. So, so they went and brought this sheikh to come test me, uh, Sheikh Jalaluddin. He was an Afghan imam in another masjid. And so he came and he gave me a test. And then he said, no, 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 he told them all, he's okay. And after that, they'd bring me date, trays of dates and treated me really nicely. But I, I, this date orchard that I was in, the masjid was in the middle of a date orchard. So dates, when, when they first shoot, it's very straight up. But as the dates ripen, it gets heavier and heavier. And it gets lower and lower. That's why the Prophet said the moment is like a date palm. So the more knowledge you get, the humbler you should get. Because the more you know, you don't know. A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Uh, drink deep or taste not the Pyrean spring. For shallow drops intoxicate the brain. And drinking deeply sobers us again. Right? The Pyrean spring was the in the mythologies, the source of knowledge. So drink deep or don't drink, because a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Where can one learn, uh, start learning Islamic ph philosophy? Um, I would first learn Islamic tradition. <laughs> like philosophy is, is, I would not suggest trying to learn Islamic philosophy. I would, I would try to learn Fardain. Once you've learned Fardain, you can study other things, but Fardain first. And then I would really recommend, I mean, we have a philosophy track at Zaytuna in the MA program. The reason for that is we need to have scholars that understand the, the current uh, worldview. You have to understand it. Like Ghazali, who learned the peripatetic philosophy and then wrote his book, Tahafat al-Falasifa. If you don't have people that know it, how can they refute it, respond to it? Uh, we see Muslims now drinking the Kool-Aid in so many areas. I mean, really adopting things that are very alien to our tradition. So th these are problems that we have you know, in our community. So, inshallah, may Allah reward all of you, bless all of you, inshallah, increase us, elevate us, inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Bless your Ramadan these last days. Inshallah, we have a few more days. Allah says, I am in ma'dudat. There are few days. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, give you tawfiq. I would really hope that people that are watching uh, will support the college. I hope that you send uh, a gift, even if it's just uh, a small gift. Uh, there's a lot of barakah. You never know where the barakah is. But whatever you're able to do, uh, please help the college. We're really trying to do something I think is very important here. And we're stewards for now. People are going to come after us. We're building so people after us won't have to build. So I hope they appreciate uh, the works. Because uh, I certainly, I, I, I'm just completely in awe of what Imam al Ghazali did. And I, I saw something when I first read it, I literally, it made me cry. He said that the work that I've done has been done largely without help. And had I had a'wan, I could have done so much more. Had I had helpers. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that towards the latter days, he said that people would have the reward of 50. And they said 50 of them or of us? He said of you. And they couldn't understand, wow, how is that? He said, you have helpers to do your work. He said, they won't have any helpers. So inshallah, whatever help you can give, it, uh, it really uh, is beneficial. And I also want to thank Harun and 
Naeem and, and all the technical people that have been working here. May Allah bless them, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.